today is the seventh annual Good Redemption Sunday. It's uh, a day that was inspired by uh, an event that takes place every year in, uh, in Times Square in New York that's called Good Riddance Day. It's an annual event that's sponsored by a company called Shreddit, who makes a business out of shredding people's or corporations or businesses' documents. And so at the, the, this event, every year, Shreddit will bring up these portable shredder trucks into um, Times Square in New York City, and they will invite people to um, write down on a piece of paper their forgettable or outlandish memories of 2021 to have them permanently and securely shredded, offering a, a, a new start then, a fresh start to a new year, destroying, it says, any and all unpleasant, embarrassing, and downright forgettable memories to pave the way for new memories in 2022. Shred it and forget it. And from the very beginning, the first time I heard about this event, I was really struck by the popularity of it. You know, what is it that would attract people to come into Times Square to write down on a piece of paper things that they want to forget as they leave a year behind and move into a new year, to, to say good riddance to those things. Why? And there's, there's a part of me that, that gets it. It's not that a lot of people don't have a lot of things that, that they would like to say goodbye to, and that an occasion an event, a time, and a date to go and do something tangible that, that kind of embodies that. And, just, and just so somehow, you know, by writing it down and shredding it, that it would have some kind of cathartic effect on us so that, that we could leave it behind. And I have no doubt in some ways that it's probably a pretty, can be a pretty significant, liberating event for people. But I also suspect that many will find that the shredder doesn't work as well as they might hope. That, you know, there are some things that, that just don't fit into the shredder. All right, for example, I mean, how many of us would like to forget the pandemic? Right? Just like be done with this thing? Somehow that pandemic, you just can't, you know, leverage that, that thing in there. And that there are... Um, Things that you don't just wash away. You just can't wipe out. Those Facebook posts <laughs> that started a firestorm and you wish you had never said it. The turmoil and maybe in a, in a broken or bad relationship. The, the shredder might do the job, right? The shredder might actually wipe out the event on a piece of paper. It's the forgetter that I think that people are going to continue to struggle with. Therefore, recognizing the desire to put some things behind us, but also recognizing that those things aren't so easily discarded, I unilaterally declared this Sunday, the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, Good Redemption Sunday. I, I took the, instead of good riddance, good redemption Sunday. To redeem, dictionary.com says, is to buy or pay off, to buy back, to recover by payment or other satisfaction, to free by ransom. Redemption is something that acknowledges that there's a debt to be paid and pays the debt. It's like when you, in California, you buy a soda, it comes in a can, and you pay a debt, you, you pay for that can, and then the state will buy it back from you. We call that redemption, the California redemption, right? They're paying us back to return it to them. Redemption acknowledges that there's a debt and pays the debt. Redemption is at the very heart of Jesus' mission when he came to earth. Peter says it this way. 
And this is from the Message Translation by Eugene Peterson. From 1 Peter 1, your life is a journey. You must travel with a deep consciousness of God. It costs God plenty to get you out of the dead-end, empty-headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood. God paid our debt. He did. He died like an unblemished sacrificial lamb, and, and this was no afterthought. Even though it, it has only lately, at the end of the ages, become public knowledge, God always knew he was going to do this for you. It's because of his sacrificed, sacrificed Messiah, whom God then raised from the dead and glorified, that you trust God, that you know you have a future in God. God paid our debt to restore our relationship to him, to reconnect us again, redemption. Hebrews chapter 12 picks up the theme. In verse 1 it says, Therefore, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with the perseverance, the race marked out for us. In light of what God has done for us, let us throw all that stuff from the past off and let us run to the future, which sounds a lot like good riddance, doesn't it? Right? Just let it, just get rid of it. But Hebrews 12 starts with this word, therefore, and when there, there's a therefore, you, you have to ask um, what, what it's there for. And, and so the passage actually says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and prior to this, in Hebrews chapter 11, it, it talked about what these great cloud of witnesses is. And it goes from, from um, Adam's good son, Abel, who offered a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. Enoch, who lived a life that was so holy that God took him up into heaven without death. Then you go on to Noah, who God, was God's chosen servant for building the ark and, and saving humanity um, from its um, the the horrific reality that it had, that it had become. It goes on to, to Moses, who led um, Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Um, Abraham, Gideon, David, Samson, the prophets, all these people who had lived lives of faith despite being unfaithful. Right? They continued to trust God, even though every one of them had a backstory that kind of said they, they, they trusted God, but they didn't always get it right. And some of them in pretty catastrophic ways. But in the context of their pursuit of God and their trust in God, God was always faithful to them. People who were filled with faith. It says, we have all these people who have gone before us. In light of them, and he says, and we also have Jesus, who's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, that Jesus perfected our faith, right? The old covenant that he came in to fulfill all the things that all those other people were never able to fulfill and deliver on God's promise to pioneer this new way to a relationship with God, the new covenant that would bring the Spirit into our lives to convict us, to heal us, to guide us, to empower us. Rather than shred it and forget it, Hebrews says, look, look at what Jesus did with hardship. Look at what Jesus, he, he didn't put it in a shredder and try and make it disappear. But the opposition of sinful people that had reached its pinnacle in the cross, Jesus, Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, for what he saw in the future, he went through the hardship for the sake of redemption, for the sake of buying us back. He, he didn't see 
the cross, he saw through the other side of the cross. See, if all you see is pain, if all we look at is pain, all we feel is pain. For the joy set before him, for what was on the other side of it, Jesus endured the cross. For Jesus, it was the salvation of the world. It was our redemption. It was the joy of that that allowed him to go through, that it made it possible for him to go through the cross. What is it for us? What is the joy set before us? Do we know what that joy is? I mean, that's what we spent all of Advent talking about, the anticipated return of Jesus and the, and the consummation of his kingdom. What happens then? John says in John chapter 1, John, 1 John chapter 3, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. That is what we are right now. But he's not finished with us yet, he goes on to say. What we're going to be for sure, what we're going to be as a finished product hasn't been fulfilled yet. There's still something that's going to be trans, a transformation process that's still happening in us. And he says, but when Christ appears, when he returns in glory, we shall see him as he is and we'll be like him. We'll be like Jesus. Like Jesus. In love. In purpose joy, full of peace, kind, gentle, courageous, faithful, glorious, all that God meant for us to, that's your future. That's in front of you. It's very personal. But it's also beyond personal. It's also transforming of all of creation, a new heaven and a new earth, the renewal of all things, all things restored. For the joy set before him, he endured through the cross. For the joy set before us, we endure the hardships and the struggles of this life. It says that Jesus scorned its shame. The, the cross was beyond cruel and unusual punishment, right? It was the, the most horrendous way that the Romans could contrive to take someone's life, and the Romans could be pretty, pretty nasty, horrible, um, mean, and vindictive people, right? And this was like the best thing they could throw at a criminal. But it wasn't just about pain. It was also about public humiliation. They wanted to drag the criminals through the streets for everybody to look at and, and not just see the suffering that their offenses visited upon them, but to make a spectacle of them. <coughs> for a Jewish person to be hung on a tree was to be cursed. What stood between Jesus and joy, Hebrews doesn't even say was the pain of the cross. What stood between Jesus and joy was the shame of the cross. The shame. Why do we shred things? I have a shredder in my house. And every time I get a piece of mail that has any information on there that I think someone might be able to use, and I guess they can use a lot of information in a lot of different ways, I take what's pertinent in that and I shred it so that that information doesn't go into the trash and somebody comes to and pitch, uh, trash picks and gets the information and uses it to harm me in some way. I don't want them to know whatever it is that they want to know about me. And a lot of people use shredders, and if you don't, you probably should, I guess. Right? We shred things because we don't want people to know those things about us. Shred it and forget it so no one ever has to, this never becomes public knowledge. Right, wrong, or indifferent. We shred because we want to hide something. Why are we shredding unpleasant, embarrassing, downright forgetful memories? Shame. It's a nasty little voice inside of our head that says, something's wrong with me. 
It could be something I did or something I didn't do, something I should have done, something I allowed to happen, something that happened and it wasn't really my fault, but the way I handled it was wrong, something that I did that hurt somebody else or something they did that hurt me, then I hurt them back. Something's wrong with me. Shame's solution to this embarrassing situation is to keep it to yourself. That's what the voice, don't let anybody else know it. Hide it. Shame's diagnosis may or may not be right. Sometimes something really is wrong with us, something that we need to deal with, something that we need to take care of. Sometimes it's just wrong, and it feels like it's wrong with me. But shame's prescription, what shame prescribes is always wrong. Shame's prescription is cover it up, hide it, bury it. In Psalm 32, David says, when I kept silent, when I hid my shame, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. When, when I tried to cover it up, when I tried to bury it, it became this giant weight that was burdening me, tearing me down. We have a saying in our family, secrets kill. Not always all at once, sometimes all at once. But we have secrets. Whatever it is that we're trying to come, they war against our soul and against our spirit. David goes on to say, Then I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When... We speak our shame. In the, in the situations where it's not our fault, but somehow we've made it about us, somehow we're blaming ourselves for something that somebody else did, when that shame is spoken, it is broken. It's brought out into the light of truth. And the truth literally Right? When we're carrying a load that's not ours to carry and we speak it and somebody looks us into the eyes and say, that's not your fault. The power of that shame over us is broken. And when it's something that is our fault, when it's something that we're responsible for, shame brings that out into the light of truth and allows healing and restoration because Jesus has covered that shame with his blood. It says, interesting, that the choice of words here. Jesus scorned shame. The, the, the impulse is to hide it, to cover it up. Jesus didn't just like put it out there. He, he mocked it. He rejected it. He reviled it. He belittled shame. You get nothing on me. Go hide yourself. Rather than shred it and forget it, Hebrews encourages us to endure hardship. To endure hardship as discipline. Hebrews 12, 7, again from um, the message. Through, through hardship, God is educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. The trouble you're in isn't punishment, it's training, the normal experience of children. Good riddance. Maybe goodbye to an opportunity that God wants to use in your life to bring redemption. 
to, to scorn shame and to, and to experience the fruit of what God purposes to do. In Romans chapter 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Paul says in this, in this passage in Romans, it says, you might want to forget it. You might want it to go away. But God means to do something with it. God's not going to waste it. If you love him, if you're walking towards his purpose, if you want God's um, purpose for your life, he says he's going to use every struggle, every challenge, every difficulty, every heartache, every heartbreak for your good. When we look through hardship to the joys set before us and scorn shame, we discover the fruit of redemption. We learn from it. Psalmist says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. We learn from our sufferings. We learn from our hardships. God teaches us through those things. Instead of stepping back and saying, how can I make this go away? What would God teach me? What has God taught me through it? And this is a process that you can actually do for heartaches and heartbreaks are a long time ago, right? You can go back and say, at this point in my life, this happened, and I processed it this way, and I walked away with this conclusion, but I see now that wasn't the truth. God, what were you teaching me? How can you redeem that? <clears throat> we learn from it. When we redeem our hardships instead of trying to escape them, we're shaped by them. We are who we are because of how God has used those things in our life. We rejoice in our sufferings, Paul says, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces hope. When I read this, and I think perseverance produces character, I sometimes feel like I must be Mickey Mouse, right? Because, dang, I've had to persevere in a lot of things. Produces hope. We are who we are because of the things we've been through. I heard one time that, that almost every youth pastor was a recovering junior hire. I did youth ministry for... Because why? Because recovering junior hires are people who had to recover from something that was traumatic that they went through, and now they're in a posture and a place where they can actually help somebody else go through it. They've been shaped by it. And then the next step, and then we minister through it. The God of all comfort comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Alcoholics Anonymous has made a, a, a complete life-transforming ministry out of this, right? People who have been alcoholics are the best position to help an alcoholic. People who have experienced addiction are the best position to help somebody come out of addiction. Someone who's gone through the heartache and the heart, heartbreak of, of joblessness is in the best position to help someone who's lost their job. Someone who's lost a child is in the best position to help someone who's lost it because they've been there, they've experienced God's transformative power in their own lives, healing and re restoring them, and can now help somebody else with that. We want to bury it. We want to put it away. We want to hide it. We want to shred it and, and forget it. And God says, no, 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 no. 
Because see, there are people all around you who need what you've gone through and what you've experienced in your life to help them on their journey. We minister through it. And when we redeem it, God receives the glory for it. We know. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. If you think that I am a wonderful, fabulous human being and a God-fearing Christian in every aspect of my life and perfect, you might look at me and say, oh, well, all the things he does, or he does because he's a really good person. And good people just do good things. He's a good person, so he does good things. If you know that I am a broken, frail, weak human being that messes up every day, just like most of you, and maybe worse than some of you, maybe worse than all of you, I don't know, and you see something coming out of my life that is good. You will not say, Tim's a great guy. You will say, God is a mighty God. He can use even that guy. Which if you go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and you know all the stories of Abraham and Moses and David and the lives that they lived and the things that they did, you don't say those guys are amazing people. You say, wow, God is an amazing God. God gets the glory when we allow people to see the brokenness and the pain and the shame of our own lives and how God worked through it. He gets the glory. Good redemption instead of good riddance. I'm going to start at the same place. What are the unpleasant, embarrassing, and downright forgettable, forgettable moments from 2021? What do you want to leave behind? What do you want to get rid of? But instead of writing it on a piece of paper and dropping, dropping in, a, in a sweater, sweater, shredder, pray this prayer. I passed, there's notes on the back. I got to some of you, maybe not everybody got them. Um, if somebody wants to grab them and they're on that stand in the back, thanks, Deb. And they're also... Um, uh, they'll be on the Church Center app, and you can find them there. This is an exercise that, that I want you to do this week, because this is the last week of 2021. It's that time when we're kind of looking at our lives and saying, where have I been, and where am I going, and what am I going to do in this new year? Instead of shredding it and forgetting, forgetting it, I want to, to walk you through this exercise, and I want you to do this this week. I want you to. You don't have to, but... If you don't, then you'll hear a message this morning that won't really help you um, that much. Start with this. A prayer from Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Start with a simple prayer. Say, God, don't show me what I see. Show me what you see. As much as I can handle, you show me what you see. And then these questions. God, what, not Tim, God, what do I need to confess? Where am I off the rails that maybe I don't even know I'm off the rails? Where am I missing it? Anxious thoughts are a great window of those things. What are we feeling anxious about? Why is that anxiety there? What do I need to confess? God, who do I need to forgive? Right? Unforgiven stuff that we have with other people hurts us. Who do I need to forgive? What, what do I need to let go of in this relationship so that I can move forward? God, are there agreements that I need to break? Uh, by agreements, I mean, um, are there deals that I've made with the devil, conclusions that I've made about things that have happened in my life 
that, are, that, that is an agreement that is not true. Things like we make agreements when we say we get hurt and we say, I will, I will never trust anybody again because no one is trustworthy. It's an agreement. It's not true, right? That person's not trustworthy. You know that. It doesn't mean nobody in the world is trustworthy. We get our hurt. Somebody doesn't come through for us. And, and then we come to a place of saying, it's, it's up to me. It's an agreement. I said, I, if it's going to happen, I'm going to do it. If you say something like, um, people say, if, if you're going to do, you want something done right, how do you do it? Do it yourself. It's an agreement. Can you do everything? There are a lot of things that if I want done right, I'd better not do it. We weren't actually meant to do anything alone. We were created for community. We're created as a family to rely upon each other, to trust each other, to grow. Are we perfect at it? No. But we make these agreements and they isolate us to ourselves and can disconnect us from the rest of the world. Are there agreements? Are there things that I've concluded about me that simply aren't true and I need to renounce those agreements? Are there wounds that I need God to heal? Are there places in my heart that I'm carrying stuff and it's been there for a long time, and I, I need your intervention. I need you to, to doctor me, to come in and to heal those broken places in my heart. Is there shame I need to speak? Is there something that no one knows? I've never told anybody about this because I don't want anybody to know. Secrets kill. Is there shame that you're hiding? You don't need to tell everyone. Can you tell someone? Will you tell someone? Is there shame that I need to speak to break its power over me? God, are there lessons that I need to learn? What are you trying to teach me from all of this that's going on in the world? There are some people who believe that God causes all the hardships, I actually think sin causes the hardships that we experience. Scripture teaches that whatever the cause of them, God intends to use them. God, what are you trying to teach me through the things that I'm going through? Are there lessons that I need to learn? And then finally, is there a testimony for me to share? I, is there places where I had agreements, those agreements have been broken, and I know somebody who's struggling with it, and, and I have a story that if I share with them will help them move on? Is, is there somebody who's going through something that I've been through and, and I can be a blessing to them and an encouragement to help them in the season that they're in? Is there a testimony that I have to share? Because if you've been through it, somebody else is going through it. And you have an incredible gift to give them. But not if we hide it. Not if we bury it. Then they suffer alone. It's like we suffered alone. So carve out a few minutes this week with this piece of paper. Sit down. Ask God to, to speak to you. And, and, you know, anytime I ask God to speak to me, I, he, I've never heard God's audible voice. But oftentimes, um, I'll ask God to speak, and, and a person or something will come to mind that seems kind of random, and I'll dismiss that as, oh, my, my mind is wandering, and it's like oftentimes, no, stop there. Something comes to your mind right after you. What is there? What is that? God, is that you? It speaks to us in our hearts most commonly. Listen. Allow God to guide you through this exercise, and at the end of it, respond accordingly, right? If you have a sin to confess, confess it. If you need to forgive someone, forgive them. If 
you have an agreement to break, break it. Lord, thank you that you are a good God, that you are a gracious God, that you are a loving God, that you are a God who is relentless in your pursuit of your beloved, of those that you created in your image and likeness, and sent Jesus to restore to relationship with you. I pray for honesty for each one of us in our own lives about where we are and about how we're doing and about where you're at in that and how we're handling it. That that honesty might reveal some things that would lead to a new year that leads to a new and better us. Because your spirit moves in our lives. Paul says that we're being transformed from glory to glory. Transformed from glory to glory. Clothed in the righteousness of Christ, forgiven of our sins, redeemed by your love. We're glorious. And your spirit's still working. And there's a lot of room to grow. So God, as we walk through this, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the things that we need to see and open our hearts to the things that you want to do and surrender our wills to allow you to have your way in us and with us and through us. I pray in Jesus' name.